Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for this opportunity that you've given us once again to just come together and, and study your word, to feast upon it. Oh, Father, how we just simply adore your word and the fellowship that we have with one another. I just ask that you would teach us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and that through the Holy Spirit. Filter out all of that which is not of you, but seal to our hearts that which is. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in Philippians. We're in chapter 2. We've been hovering around chapter, chapter 2, verses 15, 16, a couple of verses here for several weeks, or at least several videos. And uh, at the risk of sounding stuck on the subject that, that I've spent three to four of the past videos addressing, and, and I promise it'll be the last time, I want to just take a moment once again just to set the, the context here, set our present discussion. I think it's important. Uh, you'll, you'll see the importance of that by the time I get to the end of this. Uh, I think it's important, folks, for us to realize that these sections in Chapter 2, these sections, paragraphs, however you want to look at it, are not they don't stand alone off by themselves. It's all tied together. There's an overall context. There's also an immediate context, but uh, it all ties nicely together. Uh, that, that's one of the most remarkable things that I'm seeing at, at, at this point in, in our studies. And so we've seen that the Holy Spirit has uh, opened his heart to us. And that he's with us that that we wouldn't be here if uh there wasn't some purpose for us being here that god longs to be with us and we won't be here one moment longer than what is necessary i think i think i believe I, and i and i'm absolutely convinced that we see the heart of god here in in this uh, wonderful chapter that he longs to be with us and that it's important that he be with us while we're here and from that we clearly understand that god has a purpose in our being here and since it is the longing of the heart of the lord that we be with him and that's surely where we would be if we weren't needed here and it's the heart of the lord that we be in fellowship with him not just paul's heart the in uh, as it regards fellowship with the Philippians. We're not looking at the logic of Paul. We're looking at God the Holy Spirit here, first and foremost. It is true that Paul longed to be with the Philippians, but I believe we can also say God longs to be with us. And of course, we know that we long to be with him. The Lord Jesus Christ was given as an example as he humbled himself, he emptied himself. We spent some time looking at this. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so what we were looking at was he was in total submission to the will of the Father. And so in like manner, we should also be in total submission to the will of the Father. What is his will for our lives? Don't we realize, folks, that, that we are the recipients of a, of, a, of a salvation, a deliverance that God has given us, and that we ought to be faithful, in, and I believe this is what the text is teaching us, is that we ought to be faithful in the carrying out of that deliverance. Now, I think most people that study the passage make that, 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 that word salvation, they make it only redemption. And that's all that they ever see in the word salvation. And uh, if you follow this channel, you know that that is, uh, that is not what we're looking at here. I'm persuaded that that is an uncommon use of the word. And one of the major aspects of our deliverance is deliverance from law, from the human merit system, from human goodness, from human performance. And we stand complete 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're to carry that to its natural or supernatural, you might say, finish. And we're to do that without murmuring and disputing because it's God who works in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure always. Always. Unless we understand that God has redeemed us by his grace in Christ Jesus and given us our walk as a gift, it's, it's a, a gift from him. We cannot do all things without murmuring and disputing. And I think the brutal truth of the matter is that few Christians have comprehended that. And as a result, much of their walk is a walk of murmuring and disputing. Now, to be sure, it, it, it may not be murmuring and disputing against the Word of God as being infallible or some other theological position. Now, I don't believe it's murmuring and disputing over whether or not you got an, uh, enough... Uh, you, you know, your, the wife put enough uh, pancake syrup on your pancakes or something. We have to keep things in context. Wives are, aren't happy today, uh, it seems, with their, their husbands. Their husbands are not happy with their wives. People aren't happy with their jobs. They're not happy with the, the house they live in, the, the environment that they live in, the, the condition of their lives, their looks. So they're not happy with that. They're not, and that's becoming an incre increasingly becoming more of a concern in my life. Uh, not that I'm, uh, not that I'm uh, so vain, but... Uh, but, you know, I, I just I don't want to walk around scaring people. But many people are concerned about their looks. They're concerned about their jobs. They're concerned about their friends. Uh, who knows what? And I think that if we were able to see our lives as God sees it, our lives. Well, uh, we'd, we'd see that much of the Christian walk is in fact murmuring and disputing. And if it is, then we're not walking. We're not walking blameless. We're not walking chargeless, blameless. It, for a fact, we are blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. We begin our Christian walk, our life in Christ on that basis, on the basis of that he's, he's elevated us to that position of being complete in Christ. That we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's how we begin. It's not some life of trying to strive and attain to some position that, of which we do not possess. We begin on the basis of what most Christians are trying to, to do in, in trying to become something. God begins us at that point. He begins us our lives in him on that basis. It's amazing. And yet Christians insist upon living a life of law keeping, human performance, human merit. They believe, uh, many believe that God uh, judges them based upon human performance. And that is just not what the text is teaching, not here or anywhere else. For a fact, we are blameless in Christ, but to the extent that we don't recognize God working in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure, a charge could be laid, leveled against us, fairly leveled against us. And we will, in fact, cause other believers harm. We'll become poisonous to others. And God says that if we recognize that, that it is he who is working in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure, then we are going to be without charge and we're not going to cause harm. We're not going to be poisoned to anyone else. We're going to act like God's children and we're going to hold forth light in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation. I talked a little bit about that word in a previous video. No, that's, that's basically where we're at in our present study. And in my last video, we looked at this crooked and this perverse nation. The word perverse is a perfect passive, uh, having been perfectly perverted. And, and I've, I've tried to build slowly here 
uh, maybe perhaps some some of you would argue too slowly, but I've I've tried to build slowly to a realization that that crooked and perverse nation is not an expression primarily of the non-elect. You know, as, as if we are lights in the midst of all those who are headed for hell. I mean, that's the, the easy approach to the verse. Now, I don't think that's what it's saying. I mean, first of all, it assumes that we can be light to them, whereas God declares that the God of this world has blinded their minds and their eyes. They cannot see, and they cannot comprehend the light of, of God. It needs pointed out that the term the crooked and perverse nation or, or wicked and perverse nation is not an uncommon term in the Word of God. It is used as a general term when God speaks of His people, okay? His people. He uses this in, in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm going to read that to you here. Deuteronomy 32 verse uh, 5. His people have acted corruptly uh, toward him. The spot on them is not that of his children, but of a perverse and crooked generation. And I want you to note that he, he didn't say Egypt was a wicked and perverse nation. He didn't say the Canaanites were a wicked and perverse nation, you know. Nor did he single out any other nation. He spoke of Israel, his people, as a crooked and perverse nation. We see the words used by our Lord when he and, and, and James uh, and Peter and John, they all came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, if you go over to Luke chapter uh, 9, uh, and it came to pass that on the next day when they were come down from the hill, much people met him, and behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only child, and lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly cries, uh, cried out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering said, O faith, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? The point, folks, that I'm trying to make here is that the human merit system today is no different than Israel was in our Lord's time. They had no inclination, no, no desire, no inclination whatsoever to be as we're, we're told to be here, obedient to the will of God and be delivered from that legal system of human merit, worldly by all biblical standards. Folks, we know it was Judaizers who infiltrated the church practically from its beginning. I was asked if where was I was going to go from Philippians. It's, it's kind of a far look ahead, but I... I, I actually agreed to go uh, into a verse-by-verse -verse study through the epistle of, of the Galatians, and I think that's a great place to go from here if we get that far. Uh, it's the man there possessed of a demon in that passage. It That his disciples had, they were unable, okay, to to cast out this demon. It was to his disciples that he said they had no faith and they were a wicked and perverse nation. Well, why didn't they listen? Why didn't they believe? Because they were a wicked and perverse nation. The fifteenth verse says that we shine as lights in a world system. And you have the definite article there. Uh, that's the word the 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 definite article if you have the authorized version among whom you shine as lights in the world now as is a characteristic of the authorized version they they sprinkle it full of definite articles many of which are not there the text says in order that you may become without charge now the charge is surely not one before god's judgment seat because there won't be any condemnation because you, you, al you are already without charge before his judgment bar. 
I'm certain that the Holy Spirit used extreme wisdom in laying out the format of the scriptures and 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 keeping things in context. There is no judgment, folks, for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. That's we can settle that once once and forever. Any of you out there who who concludes that he's facing judgment before God that there's any judgment that you face then you, you've simply not believed what God has to say the judgment I faced was placed on Christ and I do not face a judgment for sin I do of course anticipate an, an accounting of how I used the talents the the responsibilities the, the the graces the gifts that God the abilities that God gave me and I tremble as I think of that accounting but it, it's not an accounting of how I performed in the flesh if you understand what I'm saying I know that in the Lord Jesus Christ, folks, I will not be charged for sin. And I don't think that's the concept of the charge that we're reading here. But I read commentator after commentator who are certain that the subject of the 15th verse is moral. You know, that you might live high moral lives. And folks, I have nothing against living high moral lives. I believe Christians should. I believe that when you read in the newspaper about some terrible moral evil, and if you suddenly see that it's ascribed to a profess, uh, one who professes to know Christ, then you're just intrinsically shocked. And, and I think that's right, and I think you should be. But when we make morality our gospel, then we lose sight of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe that that's the charge here. I believe the charge here is whether we go forth as who we are as light holders of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The charge has, has more to do with my accounting for my use of the opportunities that have been mine than it, than it has to do with human performance. And if I don't recognize that it's God who's working in me both the will and do of his good pleasure, then I am not free to spend my time as a light holder of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I'm going to spend my, my, all my time trying to, to engineer my life so that it'll be like I think it ought to be. Rather than to sit back and realize that God is working in me both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And if I fail to realize that, I, I then, well, I become, I'm not harmless, but harmful in my presentation of the gospel. And I've been placed in a world system. That's what the text says. Among whom you shine as lights in a world system. And what is that system? It is a crooked and perverse generation. So with fear and trembling, folks, I'm going to suggest to you that, that it's the church. In Jude, we, we read that we should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. It wasn't delivered to the world religious system based on human merit, who are, who are, who are for the most part, trying to become saints. It was delivered to the saints. As much as the church becomes a human organization, it becomes a world system. And isn't it amazing? You know, we know that the only saints that, that, that he's, we know, folks, that the only saints he's really concerned about are, are this handful that meet here on this particular YouTube channel called Blessed Hope Forever, and then all of the rest of, of them are idiots, right? I, I, I hope you see the sarcasm in that. You know, they, they don't know how to study the Word. We do, we do, but they don't. You know, they don't know biblical truth. They've been deserted by the Holy Spirit and God the Father. I mean, folks, we can't do that. You can't say that. Right here, right here where we're at, okay? And I know this is a cyber, you know, space, cyber, you know, fellowship. But right here, there is both wheat and tare. We form a world system and suddenly much of our time it's it, it, it's it's not 
It's not that the saints might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but something else entirely. What I'm trying to highlight is that we suddenly become a system. Okay, and we lay down rules and we lay down regulations and law and we do it almost unconsciously. Our attention is slowly drawn off of, away from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It was to a world system that God Almighty declared both in both the Old Testament and in the New that you are a wicked and perverse generation. He wasn't speaking to those outside of his assembly, but he was speaking to his own people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. <clears throat> now, don't misunderstand me. I, I am not saying that you can't be a spiritual people in the midst of a large, organized fellowship. You know, you're going to this church, and they're, they have two sermons on Sunday, Sunday morning, about 5,000 people attend. That's not true. What I'm suggesting is that the Holy Spirit's prime concern is with you, with your heart, and with your relationship with Christ. And in that sense, you are a light holder in this world system. And I, I think this world system needs it. I think it's a great mistake in, in studying this passage to, to conclude that the church of, Christ, of, of Jesus Christ is a light holder to an unchurched world. When I believe the passage says that you as an individual uniquely fitted by God have been given certain abilities in holding forth light in the midst of a system like this one. Folks, there isn't a body of believers any place to my knowledge that, that formed a new organization who didn't form it for the, for the faith and the purity of the truth. I think it starts out that way. I think if I had only three viewers, there might be two who wouldn't fellowship together because they held different opinions. But, but I also think that they would all be going to heaven, that I would see them all in glory. But they, but they couldn't fellowship together because of their association with the world system. If we sit here thinking that we have such a, you know, uniquely wonderful fellowship where there is no criticism, no lack of love, uh, you, know, you know, everybody here is a, is a purebred saint living on the highest moral plane, well, you know, where we look down on every other church in the entire world, I tell you that by that much, Okay, we, our eyes have been taken off of Christ, and we become a wicked and perverse system. You, as individuals, have the opportunity to hold forth the light of the gospel in the midst of this world religious system based on human performance, human merit. Our text, I believe, is saying that you people have the opportunity if you'll simply live without murmuring and disputing, recognizing God's working in you both the will and do of his good pleasure, you have the opportunity to hold forth light in a world system. And I would suggest that the nearest world system that I can think of is blessed hope forever. Folks, we aren't any different. Yeah, I do. I think the people of God are called here a wicked and perverse generation. And you and I have the opportunity as saints, individual saints, of holding forth the light of the truth of the Word of God to those people. The other side of, of the coin is to, is, to some degree, we are part of that wicked and perverse generation. The question is, how much... We are able in our own thinking and understanding of the Word of God to divest ourselves of that which leads us astray. The children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. They were God's people. They were redeemed people. And when they had a problem, God gave them the brazen serpent. And in their great zeal, 400 years later, they're worshiping that, that brazen serpent. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that Blessed Hope Forever is wrong, but I want you to realize, I want you to recognize it for what it is. It's a world system, and you have the opportunity of holding forth the word of life, verse 16. And it's a present tense. I'm not certain I wouldn't translate the Greek holding fast to the word of life because I think the present context is your individual faithfulness to the word of God. And in that faithfulness and in that understanding of what God is doing in your life, you've got the opportunity to be a light holder in a world system. And you hold fast to the word of life. A wicked and perverse nation. A world system that is wicked and perverse. It has, folks, it has tear sowed in its midst. The word offered is, is a present passive. Since I am being offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all, says Paul. We as members of the body have the opportunity to fill up that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. It's because you're bearing the afflictions of Christ and you're filling up that which is lacking in that suffering. Christ told his disciples not to be amazed at that. John was amazed. You know, one of the last times that you see the Apostle John in fellowship with our Lord is just before his crucifixion. When he says, don't be amazed. If the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. The world I'm speaking about is Judaism. God's people, a system that, that should have been a system that drove them to Christ. Why would, why would it amaze John in Revelation that people were redeemed by the shed blood of Christ? You see John standing there amazed. Okay? Over the, why would that amaze him? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that they were redeemed I mean, that, that's not what amazed him. But that they were put to death by the church system, by an ecclesiastical system. They were put to death by the world system. That's what amazed John. Christians are not primarily suffering today because of, of outside forces, but because of the ecclesiastical system. And all of Fox's Book of Martyrs were martyrs, by that ecclesiastical system. It was the ecclesiastical system that caused their death. The Lord Jesus Christ provided a redemption for us totally separate from that world system. We were individually redeemed and individually made the righteousness of God in Him. And we, as individual believers, are filling up the afflictions which are behind in the suffering of Christ, and in that we ought to rejoice together. And in as much as we don't rejoice, we don't understand that it's God working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And I see in the text that it's not only we who are rejoicing. I mean, we, we are rejoicing in the near view. Paul's rejoicing and the Philippians are rejoicing. But I believe the text says more than that. God is rejoicing. A joint understanding, a joint comprehension that leads to a joint rejoicing between God Almighty and we, the redeemed, the redeemed of God. And in verse 17, we have a first-class condition which clearly indicates that we cannot get away from that suffering. Folks, you're not going to get away from it. Now, we may want not to suffer. And we want to believe all, all of that comes because, well, we're not living right. You know, our lives aren't, you know, we're not, we're not doing things right. We're not living righteously before God. You've got to be kidding. They that shall live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In Philippians chapter 4, let's jump, that's, we don't, I don't want to jump that far ahead really, but in, in the fourth chapter, we've been appointed to this suffering. God could not have been any clearer in pointing out that we are going to suffer in the spiritual environment in which we live. 
And we're going to do that because of, guess who? Because of Christ. And we can't escape that. It is a foregone conclusion. You know, very similar to what we saw in the letter to the church of, of, of uh, Smyrna, if you remember back in our study through Revelation. You're going to have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. You know, it would have been much better if he had just said, well, you know, maybe you're going to have tribulation. He didn't say that. Maybe you're going to face death, but he, did, he didn't say that. There is a theme in this passage of Scripture which we, we, we should not miss, folks, that, that I, I just want to mention before I close, and that's, that's a theme that deals directly with the quality of our walk. How much are we seriously involved well, in our health and retirement and our, our, our job, you know, our advancement, uh, our promotion, you name it. I'm not saying all those things are bad, folks. But, but how much time are we really dedicated to the principles of Christ, recognizing that we are going to suffer? We're going to fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. And that our, our certainty, our goal, our hope is in the Lord and not in this world system. And, and so we come to uh, a very interesting passage here that, that, that I've got to spend some time on. And I'm not sure I can do that in this bit, video, but Paul says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state state that's for all seek their own not the things which are jesus christ and folks i think you have a real task to try to make that passage make sense so that's what i'm going to try to do just a little bit here before i close and then we'll pick up there again on this uh, in my next video but uh i have no man no man like-minded now now folks we can take the easy way out i suppose and I want to look at some screenshots I put on my phone here that this is a no, no man, no one, nothing at all. The word is a powerful negating conjunction. Okay. No man. Right. Are we to think folks that Paul, I mean, now I understand he was in prison. And he, and he had a number of people that he knew, a number of people that were coming and going. Uh, are we to conclude that he had no man? There was no, in, in Paul's mind, he could not think of any person at all, no man, no man, like-minded, who will naturally care for the state of the, the Philippians, their spiritual welfare, their, their condition. No one. It's interesting. I, it, this is what I love about, you know, the whole idea of, of the Holy Spirit being the author behind him, not Paul, okay? He's, God is very precise in how he words things. He's very precise in how he presents truth. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. There was no one. Well, no, listen, hold on a minute. He's sending Timothy. Now, we'll look at Epaphroditus here later, but he's going to send in the Lord. He's convinced, okay? Paul is, he's, he's hoping. You might say the word there is hope, I think, uh, in the original, te in the uh, authorized version. It, he expects, he expects in the Lord to send Timothy. Is Timothy one that is, does he fall into that category of, well, you know, of uh, Timothy won't naturally care for your state. Timothy really seeks his own affairs. He doesn't seek the things which are Jesus Christ, but I'm going to send Timothy. The text doesn't say, for I have no man like-minded except Timothy. Doesn't say that. I'm trying to get you to think here a little bit out, maybe outside the box. Maybe read a little bit in between the lines, the, the white spaces here. No man, no man 
who will naturally care for your sake. I'm going to suggest, folks, that apart from the Holy Spirit, the natural man does not have the ability at all whatsoever. No natural man at no time has the ability to care about you or me, to care about our, our state, our condition, our spiritual condition. That's what I'm going to suggest. You Greek students out there, if you want to go through these, these, these words, they're really interesting. The uh, like-minded, that's of the same mind of spirit. No man. There's not a one. Except Timothy. Is the text saying that I have no man like-minded except Timothy who will naturally care for your state? I don't think that's what it's saying at all. The word uh, sincerely, that's genuinely. That is a, there's no question, but that that is, that means it's sincere and genuine. And uh, this old verb, this, there's, this, uh, there's an original word in the text. It's an old verb uh, that talks about, that really, it, it, it's, a, it's an old verb that was used for worry and anxiety literally to be divided or distracted it's 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 more commonly used in this negative sense in the new testament it's uh you're, you're pulled apart in different directions that's 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 the word it's uh this is in the 19th verse i should have had this more prepared in my notes but i'm going to go back here to, to uh, the original text so as it concerns the 19th verse but i trust in the lord to send tim uh, timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when i know your state For I have no man like-minded who would naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father he hath served with me in the gospel. I don't think I'm, I'm doing a very good job of explaining this, and I probably just, just should have really prepared myself better for this in the in the in the video to follow it's just i wanted to, to set something forward here present something here for your thinking between now and the next video something for you to think about which is that the natural man discerneth not the things of the spirit there's the natural man and there's the spiritual man the natural man is not concerned whatsoever about any thing that has to do with anything any any part of your your spiritual well-being being your spiritual welfare at all the natural man does not it's a natural inclination it's just it's uh it's it's just it's it's natural for the natural man to not care about you or others your 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 even your own physical well-being uh Never mind others. It just, it's not a part and parcel of the flesh, the natural man, the unrenewed part of our mind. It's, there is no one. I believe what Paul is saying, and you, this is, uh, I don't ask anybody to agree with me, just something for you to think about. He's not saying, Paul's not saying that he didn't, he didn't know people that he couldn't send people, others besides Timothy, that would genuinely, sincerely care about their state. He's not saying that. I believe that there were others. I, th I think what he's saying is, is, is that he's trying to get the, the Philippians to focus their attention on the fact that of who Timothy was and how sincere and devoted he was to the truth of the gospel. I mean, we are looking at Timothy, first bishop there at Ephesus, much younger than, than Paul, of course, probably by 30 years at least. Timothy was probably in his 20s. He was a young man. But he, was, he, had, he had some some credibility. 
Okay, as far as the gospel was concerned. Uh, naturally, he would not have cared about the state of the Philippians, but, but the Holy Spirit in Timothy's life did. Look, I'm running out of time. I just want to take a moment here again to thank you all for your wonderful comments you've left that you continue to leave me. I want to I want to tell you how much you're on my mind, how much I pray for you constantly. And I ask for your continued prayers for my health in the direction of this ministry. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And until next time, thanks for watching.